Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to start with some questions. Um, what is this? A black box, correct. So the characteristic of a black box is that something goes in, something comes out, but you don't know what exactly happens inside. A second question, what is this? <laughs> it looks like a black box, correct? But it's a building of Nelson Labs Belgium in Europe, uh, in Europe so that you're going to visit later this day. Uh, but indeed, it's it looks like a black box, and for many of our sponsors, it is also a black box. So again, something goes in, something goes out, without knowing what exactly happens inside. And in our case, so the input is a medical device, and the output is a report. Uh, just a small note, so the screws you're seeing here, you don't want to have them implanted. I just bought them in a local do-it-yourself shop because uh, I don't want to have some confidentiality issues and because they were much cheaper than real implants. Um, so the goal of today is to make the Nelson Labs black box less black, to give you some insight in what we're doing at Nelson Labs Europe. So as such, we come to the topic of my presentation. So I will talk about ISO 10993 part 18 giving you an introduction to extractables and leachables testing for medical devices. So when do people knock on our door? Yeah, as Lisa just explained, so according to ISO 10993 part one, you have to write a biological evaluation plan, a BEP. And in this plan, it can be mentioned that ENL testing according ISO 10993-18 is needed. And very likely this is because to address some biological endpoints like carcinogenicity, genotoxicity, systemic toxicity, without the use of animals. So what is extractables and leachables testing? So here we have the example of a pacemaker that is implanted in the patient. And on this device, there can be some compounds still present from the manufacturing process, the packaging, the sterilization process. But these compounds might leach into the patient and cause some health issues. So in extractables and leachables testing, we are interested in which compounds can migrate from this device into the patient and at uh, which concentrations. So this is described in ISO 10993 part 18. And subsequently, a toxicologist is going to evaluate whether these compounds at these concentrations are harmful for the patient or not. And that's done using uh, ISO 10993 part 17. So I will talk part about part 18, and one of the coming speakers will talk about part 17. So what is now the difference between extractables testing and leachables testing? In extractables testing, you're going to look for the substances that are released from your medical device using laboratory extraction conditions. So you're going to apply aggressive conditions, so exaggerating the real use, and you're interested in what can come out of the material. In contrast, in leachables testing, you're going to look for the substances that are released from the medical device during its clinical use. So you want to know what does come out from the material in the patient, but it's obvious that you cannot test it really inside the patient, so in case of medical devices, leachables testing is in fact more a simulated use extractable study, where you're going to simulate as good as possible the clinical use, but in the lab. So it are more simulated use conditions, less aggressive as used in extractables testing. So as a consequence, the leachables are always a subset of the extractables. 
Um, in fact, so the general flow is that we often start with an extractable study, and if there are any issues, we might proceed with a leachable study. So in the coming slides, I will mainly focus on the aspects of a general extractable study. Um, so as already told you, so our input is a medical device. Output is an, uh, a report containing the compounds and the concentrations that can migrate from the device. Um, so a first step is that we make an extract of this medical device. This extract is subsequently analyzed by uh, different techniques. And then we obtain a chromatogram. We put a threshold. And all compounds above this threshold need to be identified and quantified. So my talk will about the first step, and I will end with a chromatogram. And then the subsequent speakers will cover that last part. OK, so the first step is a sample preparation. So we start with a medical device, and we end with an extract. So we always receive the test item of our sponsors and a two remarks regarding this. So we always test the final finished medical device. So if the device is packed or sterilized, we also need to receive the medical device packed or sterilized. And we only test the patient contacting parts, so that can be direct or indirect, but non-patient contacting parts don't need to be tested. So then we put these test items in a container and we add some solvents. Uh, the guideline says to use two solvents of differing polarity. So most often we use water as a polar solvent and hexane as a non-polar solvent. In case of blood contact or long-term implants, a third semi-polar solvent like isopropanol can be added. Again, two remarks, you also have to consider the use. Are there interactions with specific solutions or drug products? You might add an additional solvent. Or in case of indirect patient contact, it can uh, suffice to only test uh, one extraction solvent. And for example, in case of a saline infusion bag, it can be sufficient to only test sodium chloride as an extraction solvent. Uh, and a second remark, so we also have to avoid solvents that cause swelling or uh, degradation. So a typical example is uh, silicon devices that extremely swell in hexane, or polyurethane tubings that um, yeah, swell in the semi-polar solvent isopropanol. Um, okay, so now we know which solvents we have to add, but how much solvent do we add? So what is the extraction ratio? Uh, part 18 doesn't say anything about this, and that's why we often use part 12 for this. But part 12 is mainly meant for the uh, sample preparation in case of biological testing. But so depending on the thickness of our device, we often use three or six centimeters square per mil. But when it's difficult to calculate the surface area, it's also possible to use a weight-based ratio. So the next step is that we're going to incubate this for a certain time at a certain temperature. And this is mostly done under shaking conditions in an incubator. Um, part 18 is mentioning um, this table with, um, depending on the context category, recommended extraction conditions or credible alternatives. And these go from a simulated use condition to an exaggerated condition or an exhaustive condition. A typical exaggerated condition we are using is uh, 50 degrees C, 72 hours. Uh, for some devices, exhaustive extraction conditions are needed. So then we have to determine beforehand these uh, conditions. And this we do by a sequential 24-hour extraction cycles of the same device. So we're going to... Uh, extract the same device for 24 hours, so we obtain several extracts. And these extracts we're going to evaporate, and as such we obtain the non-volatile residue. This we're going to measure with a balance, and from the moment that this non-volatile residue is less than 10% of the 
of the residue that was measured in the first extract. The definition says that you're exhaustive. So in this case, we would extract the test item for 96 hours at 50 degrees. So after this incubation step, we're going to remove the test items and we, are, we obtain our extracts. This extract we're going to anal an uh, analyze with several techniques. So when we're going to put a threshold and all compounds above this threshold, we're going to identify and quantify. So as already told you, so in this extract, there are compounds coming from diverse origin, from the manufacturing process, the packaging, and some of these compounds are inorganic, like the elements. However, most of them are organic. And so depending on the size, so the small ones are volatile, the larger one semi-volatile, and the biggest one are non-volatile. But seeing this diversity in uh, compounds, we, we need an array of analytical techniques to analyze them. Uh, if we start uh, to the right, so the elements, these are the most easy because it's a limited list of elements, so we can look for all of them. So this is what we call a targeted analysis. And at Nelson Labs, we do this by ICP-OS or ICP-MS. Um, for the organic compounds, this is different because you don't know which compounds you're looking for. You don't know which compounds are sticking um, to your device. So, um, this is, what we, this is what we call screening technique. So you don't know what you're looking for, but you want to catch everything that is in your extract. And um, yeah, that's, we, do, we uh, use uh, chromatographic techniques. So for, the small volat uh, for the small compounds, we use Headspace, GCMS. For the larger ones, GCMS. And for the biggest one, LCMS. So the output of a chromatographic technique is a chromatogram. So on the x-axis, you have the time. On the y-axis, the abundance. And each peak corresponds to an extractable that was still present on your device. But to analyze or to identify each peak, that would be hell. But luckily, the concept of the analytical evaluation threshold has been developed. So according to the definition, this is a threshold below which the analyst need not to identify or quantify leachables or extractables or report them for potential toxicological assessment. So all compounds above this threshold needs to be reported, identified, and quantified. But what determines this uh, AET? So in part 18, you can find this formula. So the IT is a concentration-based threshold expressed in microgram per mil, and it's ex uh, derived from a, a dose-based threshold or threshold of toxicological concern, which is expressed in microgram per day. So below this threshold, there is no concern. Above, there might be. Um, for medical devices, there is a, a technical specification, 21726, specifying which um, DBT or TTC you have to use. So depending on the contact category, it goes from 1.5 up to 120 for limited contact devices. So you can derive from this so that the, the shorter um, patient contact, so the higher the DBT, the higher your AT will be, so the less compounds you will need to uh, report. Then in the formula, you have also an uncertainty factor. So these um, chromatographic screening techniques, yeah, due to their screening nature, the reported concentrations are not 100% accurate. So there is some uncertainty in a reported concentration. And that's why we have this uncertainty factor. So by dividing by this uncertainty factor, so the AET will be lower, so you will report more compounds. So it's a bit to be sure that you don't miss any compounds. I mean, the amendment of part 18, you can find this formula, how you have to calculate this uncertainty factor. Uh, at Nelson Labs, we have yeah, determined this using our in-house library. 
So at Nelson Labs, we use an uncertainty factor of two for GCMS and five for LCMS. Then you have still some factors, A, B, C, to convert that dose-based threshold to a concentration-based threshold. So A is the number of devices used to generate the extracts, B is the volume of the extracts, and C is the clinical exposure. Um, a quick example, so let's say that we have an implant that can be implanted for more than 10 years. So then we have to use a DBT of 1.5 microgram per day. Uh, let's assume that one device was extracted in 50 ml and that we have a clinical exposure of two devices per day and an uncertainty factor of two. If you then put it in a formula, we, we obtain a specific uh, AT. Okay, so now we know where our AT is. So in this case, we would need to report, identify and quantify, uh, quantify five compounds. And as such, I can give um, the floor to the coming two speakers. Uh, they will tell you something more about the identification and the quantification of these compounds. But to conclude uh, my talk, uh, what are the take home messages? So regarding the sample preparation, this is a really crucial first step. And you have to think before you start with the testing. So are you testing what you need to test? So the final finished medical device and only the patient contacting parts? And are the chosen extraction conditions justifiable? So depending on which solvents you're using, which temperature and time, can you justify why you've used them? And are regarding the analysis, so seeing the very diverse compounds, you have to screen broad, so using many different techniques at the right limit. So you have to see that your, the calculation of your analytical evaluation threshold is correct. Okay, that's my talk. If there are any questions, you can ask them.